Um, it's, it's our pleasure to be able to present you with some of our thinking around general election 2019, the election that has been predicted for quite a while, um, but for which predictions are difficult. So everything that we do say clearly comes with the usual government health warning around how hazardous it is to predict what's likely to happen in the election in three and a bit weeks' time. But I'm delighted that we've been able to get this briefing together with Roger and Jack because I think between us, we come at this slightly differently, so we'll probably give you as broad an analysis of what we think might happen as we possibly can uh, this morning. So this is what we're going to aim to cover in this morning's, uh, this afternoon's session. Um, I'll say a little bit initially around uh, the election and the background. I'll be handing over then to Roger to talk about some of the current polling evidence. Um, Jack will talk about some elements of the campaign and the battleground uh, that we think is critical up until this point. Um, and then we'll all chip in with some analysis of seats to watch. And then we'll open it up to some very general questions from you. I'm sure we'll have lots of those at the end of uh, the session. A uh, little bit of background, first of all. I mean, the history of elections in Wales is the history of Labour dominance, as you know. Um, there's that great quiz question, um, who was the last politician to beat Labour in a general election in Wales? Um, keep it for your pub quizzes, but it's back in 1918, December 1918, and it was Lloyd George's uh, victory, of course. Labour has been the overwhelming dominant force here, coming first in both votes and seats at 26 uh, general elections. And alongside that, there's been a long history of relative conservative weakness, which I think is different to the other parties, as you'll see in a, uh, in a graph that we'll show you in a moment. The Conservatives last won a general election here some 160 years ago in 1859. Now, looking back at the most recent general election, which of course is only two and a half years ago, um, we went into that election on the back of some polls which predicted there would be some significant changes in terms of seats and vote shares. That didn't quite happen in the way that we predicted, although in fairness the polls moved quite consistently during the general election. But what we saw in terms of the results was um, the resurgence or return to two-party politics. Um, Roger and I have written about that recently in some academic journals, and we, we've, we're very much putting the emphasis on it being a temporary return, and I think we'd be surprised if the election in a few weeks' time uh, replicates that dominance of Labour and Conservatives in terms of votes shared. Um, in terms of more recent history, uh, what we've seen very powerfully is an enormous volatility in voter behaviour. And of course, volatility in voter behaviour means significant changes in party fortunes. Um, the British Election Survey, which is the biggest survey of all of the uh, elections across the United Kingdom, uh, recorded f a figure of just under half of all voters switching from one party to another, maybe to more than one, between 2010 and 2017 general elections. So nearly half of voters vote voted for different parties in those three elections. And the figure that we have in Wales is around a third between the 2015 election and the 2017 uh, election. Now this, this table is an interesting one. Um, Thanks to Jack and Roger for compiling this, because if you, if you look at it, we're trying to emphasise that point about Labour's dominance, overwhelming dominance in elections in Wales. And we've looked at all of the other parties that have had similar dominances across the world in state and sub-state uh, elections. And you can see there that hardly any come close to Labour's dominance in Welsh general election performances. The, the, the only other one that comes near it is the Mexican party, um, right underneath it. But it, it does exemplify the point that we're making about how remarkable it is for one party to have such incredible success in winning both votes and seats in successive general elections. All right, OK. Um, the, the, the point of this graph is to show again um, how the two biggest parties have done in each of the nations uh, in mainland Britain. So you can see there the uh, Labour vote share in the dotted line, if you look at the third uh, graph of Wales, 
and the Conservative vote in the solid blue line. And you can see the gap there, which is consistent really for uh, virtually 130 years, where Labour has done uh, consistently better than the Conservatives. The reason we put this up is to give you some indication of how different that is, even with, even between England, Scotland and Wales, where you can see the, the lines merging and peaking and troughing in both England and Scotland, because people forget that, obviously, in the case of, um, in the case of Scotland. Let me say a little bit more about um, volatility. Um, when we talk about volatility, as I say, we're talking about party switching, movement between parties, between general elections. I quoted the figure of nearly half of UK voters switching between 2010, 2015 and 2017. Um, we estimate that around a third of Welsh voters actually switched between party choices in the two, election, two most recent elections in 2015 and 17. Now, the reason why volatility is clearly something that we're very interested in, in, in looking ahead to how votes will be cast on December the 12th, is because there are a whole other range of factors this time as well. Much more pronounced Brexit identities between Remain and Leave, and obviously they're superimposed on traditional party alignments, Labour, Conservative, Plaid, uh, Lib Dem and so on. And when you throw those different ingredients into the mix, it can be even harder to predict how people will actually cast their votes. We know at the moment what polling is showing is that uh, somebody's identity on Brexit is a more powerful identity than their traditional identity of voting for a party. But clearly in some areas, party identity and a reluctance to switch to a party that traditionally has been seen as problematic for that voter, despite a leave or remain stance. So, for example, a Labour voter, a Labour leave voter in the Valley switching directly to the Conservatives uh, <coughs> opens up a whole range of cultural and political issues that we can't um, properly map out at this moment in time. We also have um, some evidence from recent polling, which Roger will elaborate on in a moment, which shows how close the two biggest parties are at this moment in time. And on top of that, again, just to make things even more complex and muddier, we have the electoral pacts or agreements that have been reached, not only between the Remain Alliance, which of course is a formal alliance, and that means that 11 of the seats in Wales will only be uh, fought by one of the uh, parties that have joined together in the Remain Alliance, Plaid Cymru, Lib Dems and, and the Greens. So that's, that's a quarter of over a quarter of the Welsh seats, by the way. We also have the issue of the Brexit Party contesting, not contesting seats that are held by the Conservatives um, across the United Kingdom. So, it, so on balance, we can expect more of that to come into play um, in this election. Now, this is not a 1960s wallpaper. Um, this, this, is, this is a great graph that Jack has done, which just shows where, where the volatility happens. And it's deliberately muddled, isn't it, Jack? Because yeah. it illustrates where all of these votes are, are kind of hemorrhaging. Yeah, exactly. The, the, that it's so difficult to understand what's going on is kind of the point. So what, what this is doing is following the same people from 2005, 2010, 2015, 2017, so exactly the same people and how their votes are changing over time. Um, well, and as you can see, it's, you know, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of mess, there's a lot of churn, um, but it really just highlights this, this really key thing of volatility. You know, like we talked about this earlier, the, the bonds that connect people, you know, traditional bonds that connect people from their communities to parties are breaking and as such, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit more of a free-for-all in party competition. So just a reminder, um, this is the UK picture in the last general election, um, where, you, where you see an increase in the share of the vote for both the Conservatives and Labour, um, which created the hung parliament that we know about, that has in turn created a lot of the turmoil that we've seen in politics over the last uh, two and a half years. Um, this slide is an interesting one because it shows, I think, um, a general decline in the combined Conservative and Labour vote share from the post-war period to 2017, where we see a spike again. But I think in terms of the new multi-party environment, the new Brexit environment, it would be, it would be unlikely that we'll see that kind of dominant share, over 80% um, of, the, of the whole vote share swallowed up by the two big parties um, in this general election. 
And then the picture in, in Wales, um, again, we, we know that at the beginning of the campaign, in, back in 2017, it looked as if the Conservatives were going to surge forward. You'll remember Theresa May launching the campaign in Brackley and Bridgend, one of the target seats. And the polling that we have through the Welsh Barometer poll suggests at the moment the two parties, the two big parties, are neck and neck, just one percentage point separating them. But then if you look at the result from the uh, 2017 election, what you saw was a big surge back in Labour support. So they actually made significant gain in vote share from 2015 uh, to 2017. Again, gaining almost half of the popular votes cast in the 2017 election, which meant, of course, based on 2015, Labour gained seats from the Conservatives that they'd lost in the 2015 election. And I think now I can hand over to Roger to talk a little bit about polling. Okay, so we're just going to say a little bit about where the polls are currently standing at the moment. So first of all, uh, where do things stand? And Jax helped prepare this chart, literally updated to as of this morning. Mm -hmm. um, if any polls have been published in the last hour, apologies, <laughs> we haven't included them. Uh, but basically in this chart, so the individual dots, with the, the obvious colour codings, represent individual poll readings. The lines represent the, uh, uh, the average, uh, the, the rolling average as it changes over time. And we can see this measured at the Britain-wide level from the beginning of September. Um, and we can see essentially the period since Boris Johnson's been Prime Minister, the Conservative support has generally been trending upwards, with that upwards trend having accelerated uh, since the election was called. Uh, we see the Labour Party's movement also, particularly in the last couple of weeks, being somewhat, although a little bit more modestly, upwards. Um, the Brexit Party support has been trending downwards. The Liberal Democrats also moving downwards a little bit after their significant rise in the period leading up to the European elections. But more recently, the Liberal Democrats have tended to be declining a little bit. So that is where the Britain-wide picture currently stands, um, so with three and a half weeks to go. In Wales, well, we have, thanks to the uh, Welsh Bristol Warrant, more frequent opinion polls in Wales than we used to have. Um, this is was the full run in terms of Westminster voting attention since the last general election. And what you can see there, I think, is there was considerable stability for uh, more or less uh, almost a couple of years after the last general election. We see the Labour Party's support holding pretty steady at that high level it reached in the last general election uh, for about a year and then just starting to slowly trend downwards. The Conservative support staying pretty steady for um, well, at least a year and a half, or more or less until the beginning of this year. And then you see things getting dramatic. As it became clear that the UK government would not be able to deliver on its Brexit deadline, uh, original Brexit deadline of March, the Conservative support moved downwards rapidly. But we also saw, in, more or less in parallel with that, the Labour Party's support trending downwards. In particular, as we saw many of the younger voters who had been attracted to the Labour Party and the 2017 general election, abandoning the Labour Party in significant part, it appears, because of their rather ambiguous stance on the Brexit issue and refusing to be a more clearly and unambiguously pro-Remain party. As those two parties moved down dramatically in support, therefore the Brexit party emerged from nothing to um, see its support accelerate, uh, and not just winning the May European elections, but also doing pretty well in terms of registered support for Westminster and for the National Assembly. And we saw also, um, for the first time in quite a few years, some significant life and upward spike in support of the Liberal Democrats, as well as some movement upwards in the sport of applied Cymru. This arrives then to the most recent Welsh political barometer poll published a couple of weeks uh, ago today. The next one is due in exactly seven days' time, so you can start whetting your appetites for that. But the most recent poll is represented by this chart. If I may just explain, the solid bars in this chart represent the measure of party support in the most recent poll. So Labour Party on 29%, the Conservatives on 28%, pretty much neck and neck and some way ahead of the others. The opaque bars represent the change in that party's support since the last general election indicated by our most recent poll. So we actually see, despite you know, their very strong position in the Britain-wide polls, the Conservatives down almost six percentage points. 
but nonetheless their support having declined since 2017, much less than that of the Labour Party, which is down about 20 percentage points in, on, on June 2017. Plaid Cymru up a bit, the Lib Dems up a little bit more, the Brexit Party obviously having been created from nothing. Um, that is where things stood in the most recent reading. Uh, We'll now move on to think about say, some of the key things and some of the key places to watch, um, bringing in here a little bit uh, further polling evidence. Um, I'll just start off by looking at this idea that this is the Brexit election, is it? What do the voters say when we, when we ask them to talk about the most important issues? Jack, you take over there. Sure. OK, so uh, in the most recent barometer poll, we uh, asked respondents, what is the most important issue that you think, uh, that you think uh, or rather, what you think is the most important issue at the upcoming general election? Uh, we asked this exact same question at the same point in the campaign in 2017. And what this graph here shows is, uh, so how many people selected each issue as the most important uh, issue, and then the relative change since 2017. Um, so, as you can see, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, the issue of leaving the EU is by far uh, considered the most important issue. It's the only issue where a majority of respondents uh, selected it as being one of the top three most important issues at this election. Um, but then there's also some really big movement. So, as you can see, uh, the two issues which have really decreased in terms of their uh, perceived importance are immigration and the economy. Um, this is quite interesting, but you might think that perhaps for a lot of people, uh, issues around the economy and particularly immigration are almost synonymous with the UK's relationship with the EU, so it might be being caught up in that. Um, but there is also quite a bit of evidence that shows that people have become more uh, positive when thinking about immigration in the UK. Um, uh, and similarly, uh, the uh, at the moment, at least, although we might talk about how this is, might, is likely to change throughout the campaign, the economy isn't seen as um, being particularly important at the moment. Um, the two things that have really increased in terms of their perceived salience are uh, the environment, which is, again, perhaps unsurprising given uh, the media focus on Extinction Rebellion um, and a lot of David Attenborough documentaries recently, um, and then also crime. Um, for the increase in crime, I'm not particularly sure why this is happening. It might be something to do with the focus on policing that some of the parties have, um, that some of the parties have been uh, pushing in the last few months. Um, but there is also something to note about this kind of question, is that when people see crime listed, a lot of people will you know, automatically tick it because crime's a scary word. Um, so it's, it, there's also a possibility that that's slightly higher than we might uh, otherwise expect. So in terms of the uh, uh, things to watch at this um, election, um, obviously the Brexit election, so to what extent are the parties going to be able to, or whether they want to frame this election as a choice about Brexit? Um, a lot, we thought that was going to happen in 2017, indeed I think that was the original plan for the Conservatives, uh, but then they, they lost that framing, they lost the ability to frame the election in that way. Um, this time, it's probably going to stay a bit more relevant, I'd say, just because of the electoral pact that's happening um, and because of uh, how much people like us constantly talk about polarisation and Brexit identities. Um, in terms of some of the other... Oh, oh, sorry. And I will... Sorry, go on. So the next key campaign themes so far. Um, so one of the big things that we've all seen recently is this idea of uh, increased public spending, um, all parties are promising massive increases in spending, uh, some more than others. Um, and I think this is where we'll see the economy start to be talked about a lot more in this campaign. Uh, for political, a lot of political scientists, there's a general rule that the party that's seen as the best or the most competent on the issue of the economy wins the election. That's been true at every general election we've actually been able to measure with the survey data. Um, so. Once these ideas of increased public spending start to be debated a lot more, uh, that'll be a really key thing to, to look at, this idea of uh, who is the most responsible party when it comes to the economy. Um, the next one is obviously the second EU referendum. It's a key for a lot of the electoral pacts. Um, it's also likely to be key in some areas for 
the Labour Party, and particularly in Wales, where obviously uh, Welsh Labour have a different policy to UK Labour when it comes to how they'd campaign in a second referendum. Um, so we, another thing to watch is, you know, who's controlling the campaign messaging here in Wales? Is it a Welsh Labour on the doorstep or is it UK Labour? Another thing is the environment. All parties have published uh, uh, policies on how fast they would cut emissions. I think for Labour it's cut to zero by 2020. For the SNP it's cut to 75% cut 75 of emissions by 2030. Um, uh, off the top of my head I can't remember what the others are, but um, you get the point. And the other one is immigration. So even though we've seen immigration really fall in terms of how important uh, people think it is uh, at this election, uh, we've already seen, actually, in the media, a bit of renewed attention on immigration policies. Um, this idea, particularly of free movement, freedom of movement, uh, what's going to happen. Um, so I think that's another key thing that's likely to actually rise in salience across the election period when we get closer to the uh, election day. Uh, next, I'm going to pass you back to Roger to talk about uh, some more polling. Okay, so um, one of the key issues in any election is, is always leadership. Uh, the leaders have a very important role, in some cases as prospective prime ministers, but in all cases as the main face and voice of the campaign, the principal person articulating a party's message and seeking to connect that with the voters. Unsurprisingly, therefore, you know, polling seeks to explore what people think about uh, party leaders, how effective they believe them to be, um, or indeed how visible they are in some cases. Just a couple of bits of the most recent polling evidence how those things stand in Wales. First of all, a question in the most recent Welsh political barometer, who's you know, going to make the best prime minister out of the two by far most likely contenders for that job, the current prime minister, Boris Johnson, um, or the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, there was a, a third option, which is simply you don't know. Um, at many points during the latter months of Theresa May's prime ministership, um, polls like this, both in Wales and across Britain, found that don't know was by some way the most popular choice for prime minister, um, compared when the other alternatives were May and Corbyn. And we, one could argue in those circumstances that was, don't know is probably quite a good choice. Um, more recently, we have seen since Boris Johnson took over as Conservative leader and Prime Minister, he has generally led, um, and in this most recent poll, um, he is ahead of Jeremy Corbyn, uh, with nonetheless a significant number of voters still choosing the don't know, what, don't know option. We should, I think, you know, really kind of note here just how extraordinary this is. In Wales, the nation that, as Laura talked about earlier, has been Labour for a century, 26 Labour general election victories in a row. Yet, fairly clearly and by a significant margin, in Wales, an English Conservative leader is nonetheless some way ahead of the Labour Party leader as the most favoured Prime Minister. Another sort of question that we've asked in many Welsh political barometer polls over the years is simply to ask people to rate um, a whole list of party leaders on a zero to ten scale, where zero means that you strongly dislike that person, ten means you strongly like them and you can rate them at any point on that scale, or choose a don't know option. Uh, this chart, which Jack has helpfully prepared, um, summarises again the readings from the most recent poll. A couple of things to point out here. First of all, the very small print on the left of the chart, and sorry, some of you at the back may need to squint to read that, are the percentages of people saying don't know. Um, because what we find in these polls is that, okay, a few people might say don't know because they're genuinely undecided, unsure, but in the aggregate, the percentage of saying don't know is a pretty good measure of the visibility, the um, public profile of a party leader. And while this chart might look to be really good to use for Plaid Cymru, Adam Price is the most popular party leader in Wales, well, yes, that's off those who had a view on him. Um, but 67% of our sample, you know, fully two-thirds, had no view at all, just simply said don't know on Adam Price. Um, he's been a star for many years in Plaid Cymru. Adam Price, more than a year into the role of Plaid Cymru leader, has yet to actually connect with much of the Welsh electorate. And potentially for Plaid, one of the things which they may seek to get out of this election is significantly raising his public profile in the same way that the 2015 election substantially raised that of Leanne Wood. 
The other things to notice in this chart, though, are the, the average ratings of, of the party leader. So we have here Adam Price <laughs> plus the leaders of the four main written wide parties. None of these leaders averages even five out of ten. Politicians in unpopularity, shock. Um, but we see, say, Adam Price doing relatively well amongst those minority who actually know who he is. But again, on this measure, just as on the most fav favoured Prime Minister measure, we see Boris Johnson, an English Conservative leader, on average being more popular than Jeremy Corbyn. Um, we also see Joe Swinson not doing spectacularly well yet either, and Nigel Farage doing relatively poorly. Now, I should say that it's very strongly the case for Nigel Farage, as well as fairly strongly the case for Boris Johnson. These are figures who very much divide opinion. So Nigel Farage is very popular with Brexit Party supporters and hated by nearly everybody else. A few Conservatives are okay with him, but basically supporters certainly of all the other parties dislike Farage on average very intensely. We see a fairly similar profile of that with Boris Johnson. He's fairly popular with many Conservative Party leaders, deeply unpopular with most supporters of other parties, um, you know, to, to a really striking degree. Um, Corbyn is not doing particularly well with anyone, even with many Labour, existing Labour Party supporters. With those who have stuck with Labour, his ratings are significantly lower than they were a couple of years ago. Uh, one of the tasks for Labour in the election then would presumably to try and achieve the same surge in his popularity ratings that they managed in the lead up to June 2017. The final thing we want to talk about uh, before we move into Q&A is then the electoral battleground. So where in Wales, for instance, is, this, is the election going to be won and lost? In these deeply uncertain times that Laura talked about, trying to identify the key marginals, the key seats to focus on is more difficult even than it normally is. Um, hence, so that's my excuse for the very small font on this next slide, trying to list some of the key seats that we need to look at. Um, I should explain one or two other things about, the, about this, so this table. So we're divided for, for each column and then for, for each of the parties. So Labour, Conservative, Clyde and Lib Dems. And then the top half of the list, defence, is you know, the key seats that that party is defending where it looks to be under significant potential threat. And then the targets, those are the key seats that look potentially at least to be within that party's grasp. A couple of other details on this chart. First of all, um, seats that are underlined, that's where the incumbent MP is not standing in this election, something that nearly always makes it significantly harder for a party to retain a seat. And italics, those are seats which are part of the Remain Alliance Pact. Now, what I think this brings out, this, this table, is that the electoral battleground is primarily between Labour and Conservatives, unless the polling starts to do something really strange. But there are here, identified in this first main column, a substantial number, fully 10 Labour seats, which on available polling look very vulnerable. Um, a nine of those 10, or maybe I should say nine and a half, because on this morn is potentially a three-way marginal. Um, and you know, we've coloured the seats according to the party that is threatening uh, there, or, you know, the, or the party that is um, being fought in that seat. Um, other than that, you know, there are the 10 of these Labour seats which can potentially go from Labour to Conservatives with swings of um, no more than 7%, which is roughly what the polls are showing at the moment. Many of these seats are in North East Wales. There is a clutch of Labour seats, five of them in North East Wales, going from Vale of Clwyd to Clwyd South, all of which can go straight from Conservative to Labour with swings of less than 6%, all of which in areas that voted Leave as well. So I think that's much of the political background to, battleground to look at. I'll just hand over to my colleagues as well to comment about some of the other aspects of the battleground. Yeah, so if we look at um, uh, the Conservatives for their defences, where they're looking to uh, hold, obviously the big one that's caught a lot of attention in this uh, campaign has been uh, Vale of Glamorgan, uh, Alan Kane's seat, it says that they, they perhaps face a unique constituency battle there where local issues are going you know, to have a really big impact <laughs> on that. On, on, on that there. Uh, but mostly when we talk about the Conservatives, this election will be talking about their targets in Wales. And like Roger has talked, there's that cluster of uh, Labour seats 
um, in northeast Wales, which uh, has started to be referred to, we were again talking about this earlier, as the Red Wall, Labour's Red Wall. Um, I think one way you might think about it is if any of you are ever interested in uh, US politics, you know, there's this saying, so goes Ohio, so goes the nation, that kind of thing. It's, Ohio is this perfect uh, representation of how the rest of the uh, states in the US are going to vote. I think that's very similar for you know, these conservative target seats in northeast Wales. The demographics are very similar to a lot of uh, uh, Labour seats in kind, in, uh, across the north of England. And that's the kind of thing, if we see a lot of conservative gains there uh, in Wales, you're likely to see uh, a lot of conservative gains across uh, the rest of the, uh, the country um, for, uh, uh, from Labour, that would be. Um, in terms of Plaid, I don't know if you, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Jack's absolutely right. I think the, the issue for the Conservatives, obviously, if we're to look at a Boris Johnson majority, then at least some of those seats in the North East arc have to go from Labour directly to the Conservatives. But they're not the same. I think that's the point. If you look more closely at those five seats in North East Wales, some of them have never been Conservative. Some of them haven't been Conservative for a long time. Some of them have an incumbent MP standing down, some don't. So whilst we're bracketing them for our purposes as being part of the red wall that the Conservatives have to chip into quite substantially to get their majority, the chances are that a whole range of other factors will come into play. So we can't regard those as a block in, in any particular way. Um, David Butler, who lots of you will have known, uh, will know of as the doyen of sophology, said about this election, you know, I've never been more confused and uncertain about an election outcome. And he's covered elections for 70 years. So, you know, I think we've, we've, what we're saying here has to, has to be taken with some caution. But, but if you go on to look at Plaid and, and the Lib Dems here, I mean, it's, it's going to be a difficult election for Plaid, without a doubt, because the chances are this will be an election that is dominated by... Um, again, by um, the uh, uh, rivalry as to who will uh, become Prime Minister. So once it becomes a more British-focused election, then it's clearly more difficult for Plaid. The other reason why it's difficult for Plaid is, of course, two of the seats that it, um, that it held on to, uh, regained and held on to in the last election, were by very, very small majorities, you know, ultra-marginals, as we call them. So, you know, 200 votes separated Plaid from its opponent in both Arvon and Ceredigion, which, of course, makes both of those seats um, vulnerable. And as we know, Ceredigion is out with any Remain alliance for obvious <coughs> reasons, because it's contested by Plaid and uh, the Lib Dems predominantly. Anis Morn is the, uh, I think it's fair to say, the only target for Plaid. But, but as Roger said, you know, Anis Morn is a three-way marginal, um, has often gone ways that were unanticipated, let's say. And in this case, Plaid is coming from third position to contest that election. So is isn't wasn't even the second place candidate last time. Now that's not to say we shouldn't we, you know we should rule out uh, Ernest Morn as being a, a potential Plaid game, but I think a lot of that will depend on how British an election this turns out to be and whether there does there is any momentum around a Welsh dimension to the campaign. In terms of the Lib Dems, I mean as Roger said, the Lib Dems uh, have and, and certainly had very high hopes uh, for, for this election. However, the polling is levelling out in terms of their, um, the consistent levels of support for the party. Of course, the Lib Dems captured Brecon and Radner from the Conservatives in a by-election in August, so that's their only seat at the moment, you know, after the disastrous res results in 2017. Um, so at least defending that seat from the Conservatives is, is a critical objective. And then the two targets have to be um, Ceredigion with that small applied uh, majority and Montgomery where, where again the sitting MP Glyn Davis is standing down but I think Roger's absolutely right you know what we're looking at here is predominantly is Labour Conservative head-to-heads that will determine the um, outcome of, of the election in Wales and I think that wraps up from our point of view because we wanted to allow plenty of time Rachel for Super. questions from the floor. Super. Thank <laughs> you.